The Lord bless you, saints of the Most High God. Let me greet again this evening all my father's children. Uh, thank you for tuning in another Wednesday night to Bible study. Uh, we have been, over the last couple of weeks, in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, and it is so interesting it is so refreshing to uh, see some of the things that are jumping at us that are coming from this book of beginnings. We, as I said earlier, would be so surprised to see some of the things that are here contained in the book. If we have not taken the time to drill down into some of the things, we would certainly not know some of the gems that are right there in the book. Uh, one of the things we had said is from in the very beginning, from the time of creation, there was also a show of the fact that salvation, redemption was coming, signifying, signaling to us that Almighty God from the time of creation knew that there was going to be the fall and equally that there had to be a process of redemption and from the very beginning at the very time of creation the salvation story was being presented and if we don't take the time out to look at some things we probably might miss it altogether so it is important brethren that we do take the time out to look through the book and to see the things that are there so many things that happen right there in genesis which is the book of beginnings sets the pace sets the tone establishes the, the uh, foundation that everything else that we are seeing happening in scripture is built upon if we doubt the foundation we are going to of necessity doubt everything else that is there if it can be proven that Genesis is wrong and what we have believed about creation is wrong and what we have believed about God did this is wrong and if it can be shown and many have been trying to prove or disprove the Bible to prove that God doesn't exist that the Bible is not right and they have tried to do so much to have people to cast doubt on its authenticity we are showing by going into the book and bringing things to light that otherwise we would have just left unchecked we are showing that the book can be trusted it is authentic it is inspired by almighty god and the more we look at some things is the more we learn and we see things happening plus we also get to learn and to see new things. It, we, we, we get to expand our knowledge base on some things that we would have otherwise taken for granted. And so it is good and I encourage us to take the time out, brethren, of going through in a sequential way. Take the thing from the start, go through, see the build up, see the different uh, sections that we are going through. And there is still more to look at. We cannot exhaust it, but certainly we will take our time and go through some sections of it so that we can have an understanding. Just recently, we looked at scriptures and indicated to us that when folks say that the Bible cannot be right because it does not speak to large animals like the dinosaurs that predated humankind, we show that Oh, the Bible did in fact speak about some of these things that scientists say is not there. It's just that how it is presented and how the Bible presents it and the time frame that the Bible outlines is inconsistent with that which the scientists have presented to us. And when we have a situation like that, one question is there that has to be asked. Whose word do we take? The words of Charles Darwin, the words of the scientists, or the words of Almighty God? For us, there is no question, there is no doubt. It has to be the word of God. We made the point that we, as children of God, do not shape our worldview based on what 
scientists and archaeologists tells us and then match that with the Bible. Our worldview is shaped first by the Bible because we recognize and understand that this is the word of God. Everything else fits into this frame. And it is important saints of God that we pursue biblical studies from this perspective we must understand that the word of god is paramount that the word of god is important that the word of god is the foundation and we build therefrom and so follow that in whatever studies that we do from the bible now when we also uh, well, in recent times, as we were going through, we also looked at, uh, just in passing, the fact that folks have been saying over the years, over decades, for a long time, that God had cursed Ham. And the black race was cursed. But we have shown, and there is still more to go into, to put it right in front of us, that it was not Ham that was cursed. It was not Cush who was one of Ham's son that was cursed. Cush being the father of the black Africans. He was not cursed. And therefore to say that the black race or the black people, the black Africans are cursed. And the Bible showed that a curse was passed on them. That is incorrect. The Bible did not suggest that at all. And the Bible was clear when it pointed out who was cursed. And it was not Cush who was the father of the black people, the black Africans. But it was Canaan who was the father of those who ultimately become, became known as the Canaanites. So we've got to put the thing into perspective and build from there. Now, a lot of questions, brothers and sisters, have been asked about this particular incident in the Bible. It has perplexed many scholars, it has perplexed many saints, it has perplexed many in terms of what exactly happened in Genesis chapter um, number 9. The Bible spoke about Noah and Noah had a vineyard and he planted his vineyard and when the time came and he, you know, picked the fruit and did what he had to do. It's the first time we are learning about having a winery because he made wine and he drank and became drunk. And the thing about it is that when we hear something like this happening to a man that is righteous, he was and his family were the only people that was saved from the massive worldwide flood that wiped out all humankind that wiped out all in the animal kingdom that totally destroyed the earth at the time it was only noah and his family that was saved so the bible said noah find grace found grace in the eyes of the lord so here was a righteous man here was his family uh, and yet we see that he became drunk with wine from his vineyard and it somehow tells us you know saints of God that we can we cannot be too careful and we have to extract the simple thoughts and lessons that are outlined in the episodes that we see in scriptures so here was a man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord here was a man with his family who were the only human beings that was left on the face of the earth simply because they found grace God extended his grace to this family and he was considered a righteous man and he him and his family were saved and yet look at what he did but then we are going to look a little bit further because there are some other things that happened and it is only when we start to drill into the Bible and we start to look at the terms and we start to 
understand the meaning of the terms in the context of how those folks would have seen it and understood it and understood the, the expressions that we are going to be able to put together and see exactly what the Bible was saying when it made reference to a couple of things. Now, the Bible tells us in Genesis 9 um, about this entire episode, the episode with Noah and his three sons, because we know that he had three sons, um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These were the three sons of Noah. But then the Bible said something about one of the sons, Ham, when Noah was drunk. The Bible said that Ham saw his father's nakedness, right? And then it went on to say he went back and he told his brother what he saw. And by just looking at that, we see where Noah cursed. Not Ham who saw his nakedness, but he cursed Ham's son, Ham's fourth son. He saw nothing, he did nothing, and yet God cursed him. Why? How? If all that happened is that Ham glimpsed at his drunken father, Mark you, a man being drunk, falling on the ground, in shameful nakedness, it is difficult sometimes not to see them because he could have stumbled on him. And how could you really fault a man for stumbling on a drunken man on the ground naked? So that if he saw him, and that is all that he did that was wrong, does that necessitate a curse? That is one. And two, and even if it required or necessitated a curse, why not curse Ham? Why go all the way down to curse Ham's son, who was Noah's grandson, so to speak? And so it perplexed the mind and the thought of many rabbis, other scholars, even saints today. Is it that he just saw the man on the ground naked and drunk? Because if he was drunk, he by his own self probably would have torn his clothes off. He's drunk, he don't know what he's doing. And you come and buck up into that. I mean, everybody is different and their reaction will be different. Not that you're going to dishonor and disrespect your elder or anybody else for that matter that you saw. But if you buck up into a situation and you saw it, ah, it might be a little bit hard to pronounce a curse on an entire group simply because he saw you naked and you were the one that was drunk in the first place. If there's anybody that is to be beat with stripes, it probably should have been Noah himself because he drank and got drunk and ended up in that situation of exposing himself. And notice I say it in this way. So to take it out and Ham's son sounds a bit harsh unless brothers and sisters there is more to it than what first jump at us and we are going to take a so we are in the book of genesis and we are going to take a look at this scripture again and see if there is more to it that meet than meets the eye at first glance and this is what the book of genesis is about this is what a lot of the books are about many times if we just take a cursory look or a cursory read of what is there we see some things and we pass over and we go on it is just a story but then if we understand terms, if we understand expressions, if we understand some of the sayings that are directly related to the group of people uh, that the thing is describing, we will get to learn some more and to understand some more about the meaning of certain terms and certain expressions and come to a better understanding, brothers and sisters, of what might have transpired. Of course, there are about three or so views as to what the entire episode meant. What was it that happened in Genesis chapter 9? The Bible said that 
Ham saw his nakedness and there's a school of thought that believe that he just saw something and that was it. He shouldn't have seen it and the fact that he saw it and, and, and went and told his brother instead of doing something about it, the fact that he did nothing, that was an embarrassment to his father and so he was cursed. But he wasn't cursed. It was his son that was cursed. How? Why? What's the connection between Canaan and Ham? To the extent that Noah cursed Canaan. Remember, I said it just now. If all that happened is that he saw a drunken man. And remember, it's not Ham. Certainly not from what we get from the scriptures. It wasn't Ham that gave him drink and drunk him. It was Noah that drank and became drunk. He was to have gotten stripes if anything was to have happened. But that didn't happen. Nor did Ham himself get a direct hit. Why and how is it linked to Canaan? There has to be a connection if justice is really to be served. And so it, it, it requires us, brethren, to pull back a little bit and take a deeper, closer look at this episode that many of us have known, have seen, have read over many years. And so I want us tonight, since we are in Genesis, this is another thing that we are going to look at. We are going to look at the races, as I told you, how they developed, how they spread across. We are going to look at the fact that there are uh, different, uh, what we call races. You know, some folks are black, some folks are Caucasian, what you call white, some folks are Chinese, some folks are Indian. Where did that come from? And it is clear, based on what we are taught, that it had to be a process of evolution. Because if it was God, everybody, since he made Adam and Eve, everybody would have come out just like how Adam and Eve were. We could not have this kind of diversity if we all came from one parent. But, can the Bible outline what happened? Can even science show what could have happened? And I submit to us, and we will get there since we are in Genesis, and we are going to show that the Bible is absolutely correct. And it doesn't matter what we are seeing now, we will show. And it is not hard, it is straightforward. And we will see that we don't have to go down the road of those who say there is no God and that it is evolution and all of these things over millions of years that has, are thousands, where mankind is concerned over hundreds of thousands of years that has taken us to this point. It comes right back to the word God made us and that we are descendants of one family, Adam and Eve, and that we are from one blood according to the book of Acts. And we will show all of this and explain how and why the diversity so don't worry about it we're going to take a few weeks more and wrap this up so much to look at but we will only look at a few save and accept to say that the thing does make for a good study and we will see that god is in charge and everything in the book we can take amen at face value what is there now, we're going to look at the curse of Ham, and I'm going to just go through some slide readers, and I want us to understand, yeah, as I said, there were about three or so school of thoughts on the matter, but then folks were still dissatisfied, because they couldn't reconcile, brethren, or a man just saw something, he bucked upon a situation, and all he did was to go tell his brothers, and he was, his own son was cursed. That the generations to come after him would have been cursed all the way down simply because one man saw a drunk man on the ground and go tell his brothers that that is on the ground and so folks deep down knew that it couldn't just be that it had to be something much more but what does the bible say anything about what it could have been that caused that and let's put a little bit of history and delve into it and let's see what is there. So let me invite us to look at the slide. And we are going to take our time and, and go through. And so the episode begins with, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 9. Um, Genesis chapter 9 verses 18 
to 29. And I think we should read it um, together. It's important just to give the background, 18 to 29, just to give a background so that we are clear on what is being discussed here. And so, here we go. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. No, it just tells us that out of the blue. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Make a note of that. These are the three sons of Noah. And of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan. Here again, it just stated, just out of the blue. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. And told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him and he said cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant and Noah live after the flood 350 years so the question and having having read the scriptures brethren some quest, a question or two begs to be asked it literally begs to be asked, what exactly was Ham's sin? Uh, you know, as I started out saying, you know, as simply by reading into it, we simply saw where the word said he saw his father's nakedness and he went and told his brother. And that was it. He just saw his father naked and he went in and told his brother and for that when Noah arose out of his wine when he became sober again and found out exactly what Ham had done he said cursed be Canaan and so clearly something something must have happened that caused Noah to take such a stance and just to think that his son Ham saw him on the ground and told his brother was enough to bring down a curse on, on his own grandson and not only that on his grandson but on the generations after because they all shall be servants to both Shem and Japheth going down the line. So the question again begs to be asked what exactly was Ham's sin? Why was Canaan cursed for it? Yes, and it has puzzled many. And you know, since Ham was the one that committed the sin, were they ever cursed? Why curse Canaan? And so the questions will keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. But brothers and sisters, I want us to take note of something very important. And so we're taking it from the top and we are coming down. I want us to take note that the writer on two occasions 
twice he advised us that Ham was the father of Canaan. He said it in verse 13, he, in verse 18, sorry, and he said it again in verse 22. It seemed as if this was intentional, as if he was priming us that Canaan is somehow, somewhere linked to Ham's sin. He primed us, you know, he started out and just out of the blue, Moses wrote and just told us, and, and Canaan is the son of Ham, or Ham is the father of Canaan. He just tells us as if he's making a point. He wants us to understand something. He wants us to see something. I mean, Ham had other sons. He had Cush. He had Put. He had Egypt. That's the, that's the, I forget his name, but he is the father of the Egyptians. And these three sons were there before Canaan. Why then would Moses single out Canaan and then make the point that Ham is the father of Canaan? Clearly, he is signaling something to us. And then in verse 22, it goes even further. He said the same thing again. And then he said it in relation to Ham seeing his father's nakedness, right? If you look, if you look at it clearly, in verse 22, it says, and it makes it clear, right there in verse 22, it literally is linked, he said, it literally is linked to um, Ham seeing his father's nakedness. And Ham, the father, father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. So here again, as we said, Moses link the fact that Ham is the father of Canaan. But on this occasion, it is linked with Ham's seeing his father's nakedness. And so I want us brothers and sisters to bear this in mind. And so as we go as we go further as we go further we we will bear it in mind and we will come back to, to it all right so we move on now if it was and i said it again and this is just for emphasis if it was just a mockery of seeing his father why curse canaan why not Ham? And the questions will always keep coming. So these are the things that we are going to use as a basis now to drill down to observe some things that if we don't take the time out to look at and to understand, we are going to miss a whole lot. So Genesis 9.22, it says that Ham saw the nakedness of his father then in verse 24 it says that Noah knew what Ham had done to him the, what what we are seeing here is that clearly Ham did something and clearly it was something terrible enough to the extent that in verse 24 the Bible says that Noah knew what Ham had done unto him. He, Noah, knew what Ham had done unto him. You get, brothers and sisters, the distinct impression, the distinct feel that something terribly wrong was done to him. And this is what I want us to understand. Just reading into the scripture, we are clear, we get the distinct feel. It, 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 is, it, it, it jumps at us that when he came out of his drunkenness, he knew what Ham had done, knew what this guy did to me. He's aware of what was done to him. And you get the distinct feeling that something wrong was done to him. Now, I want us to... I want us to see something and i want us to understand something and i'm going to now take us to some scriptures so that we 
understand terminologies. And I, I want us to I want us to understand something and I want us to be clear and I'm going to show that we can be clear when we start to talk about um, certain phrases, certain terminologies in different societies, in different groupings and so forth. Do you know that if we were to, in Jamaican lingo, when we tell a friend that I slept with that person, you know that for those in Jamaica, for those in Jamaica, when we hear that term, we know what it means. We know that it means you have had sexual relations with that person. You tell a friend of yours, you know, those boys or those girls are in the brag, you know, I slept with him, I, I slept with her, and last week we were up on and I slept with him. We know that that expression, slept with him, doesn't mean that the person was tired and, you know, you just tell him to come share bed space and refresh yourself and then you move on. The term for us in a Jamaican context simply means you had sexual intercourse with the person. And I'm saying this because I'm coming over to a particular point and I'm going to show us. And so if you don't understand the Jamaican lingo, if you don't understand the expression, uh, uh, someone from an African or a European country reading a Jamaican writing that, you know, when I was in my 20s, I slept with 27 ladies or I slept with 27 men. Somebody reading that man said, man, this guy loves to sleep or this guy loves to have people sleeping with him or this girl loves to have people sleeping with her. But then a good rest, not like a good rest. They might misunderstand or misinterpret because they are not familiar with the expression and the context, the Jamaican context, and it is very important. I was talking to uh, a brethren also, and he used a term, and it was equally right. If we tell some in a Jamaican term, you know, I've been talking with this girl, and pardon my expression, but I'm just saying it because we understand. But if we, are, we were seeing someone in our unsafe state, and we are expressing to a friend as you know many unsaved love to brag about their conquest especially when it is of a sexual nature and they they would say you know i was talking to her for two weeks a nice young lady and we we're up and down and you know it was it was on the last that i slapped her many persons will understand that when a guy in an unsaved is talking and he's expressing his conquest he would say i slap her it doesn't mean that he took his hand and hit her. Somebody outside of our environment, outside of the Jamaican context, outside of understanding the Jamaican lingo in terms of his expression and all, will leave with the impression that you hit her. But for those in the understanding the, the inner city lingo, and even outside of the inner city, it is accepted unsaved term to mean that he had sexual intercourse with this young lady at the end of a certain period it is important therefore for us to understand these things i want to use a totally different example so that we can bring the point across in in hebrew writings and in hebrew expression when they write and talk about the right hand of God, the Hebrew people knew that it was a term that meant a place of power and authority and might. When the children of Israel went across the Red Sea and, and they were safe, and then when the Egyptians tried to go across and God caused the waters to come back again and to drown them all, when the entire thing happened, the miraculous power of God that was displayed, that caused the sea to open and the children of Israel to go across on dry land. When the entire episode was finished, Miriam took up her timbrel and they started to dance. And they declared here in Exodus that the right hand of God has 
brought us across on the right hand of God has messed up and destroyed the armies of Egypt and they sang and they danced and they glorified God and they sang about his great powerful right hand they did not see a literal right hand they did not see God's hand as it were pushing up the waters and then releasing it no the entire manifestation of miraculous power and might that caused the Red Sea to part and then the children of Israel to go across on dry land. That entire manifestation of the power and might of God is what she described using the term the right hand of God. We must understand, brethren, and I'm going to take the time out, not just today, but in subsequent lessons, not, just, not here in Genesis, but I'm going to do it for the benefit of all the brethren. We have to understand that if we don't recognize Hebrew terminologies and recognize uh, the expressions and so forth, we might go away leaving with the wrong impression. And this is how, many, in many instances, even the acceptance of a trinity comes into being because here the bible tells us in the book of acts that stephen uh, while he was at the wall there standing up you know and they were taunting him and getting ready to he looked up and he saw jesus he saw jesus and he saw the power of god and in his expressing what he saw he said he saw god and jesus standing on the right hand of god now when he said that the people became so incensed that they you know took up stone and stoned him because no the man is not just talking this jesus jesus thing but it was no blasphemy why because he put jesus in a place pr pronouncing that jesus is god how so when stephen said that he saw god and jesus standing on the right hand of god he did not see a man standing with a left hand and a right hand and then jesus standing on the right hand side of that father figure and so you see two persons there no that's not what he did that's not what the jews around understood he used the same term that is known within the circles of the hebrews the same thing that miriam saw in exodus and describe that demonstration of the power and might of god and she called it the right hand of god when they went across that red sea on dry land it is the same thing that stephen saw and said when he said i saw god and jesus standing on the right hand of god what stephen was saying is that he saw jesus having all power and might and authority in heaven the Jews saw that. They understood what he meant. And they went ahead and stoned him to death because of his blasphemy. He's putting Jesus in the place where only God alone can be. The expression, the right hand of God, simply means to the folks in whose context it was written. Jesus is in that place of power and might and highest authority and he stands at that place it might be blasphemous to them but for stephen he knew that jesus was almighty god because he went on further to say when he was dying he called upon god and said lord jesus he knew what he was saying but the expression if you don't know this brothers and sisters you will leave believing that there was a literal right hand and see there jesus is the second person because see god there and on the right hand was jesus so it's two of them there so by just reading from your english bible and looking at that alone you will leave with that impression so i say this just to bring clarity to us and then later on i'm going to go through a whole series of this 
with all brethren. Yes, a certain study does to look at these kind of things, look at the expressions, look at what they mean in the context of the Hebrews where it was written, because the scriptures were written in you know, or not in a particular, but they were written in either in Hebrew, in Aramaic, in Greek, and we need to understand that. And so people write it and put the expressions as they know it. We have got to learn and understand and appreciate those expressions and the meaning within those contexts so that we don't misunderstand or misrepresent because that can happen and it has happened and this is how the the whole doctrine of the trinity comes about but that aside so we are making the point and we go back to the slide now we are making the point that here the bible tells us that he saw his father's nakedness now i want us brothers and sisters there's a scripture there and we're going to go through a couple of scriptures right and i want us to take our time as we go through because we are going to see and we are going to learn some things and then we are going to come to a particular position now the scripture tells us none of you and this is god now talking in leviticus because prior to now there was a time before in years gone by in early in, in the book of genesis where certain things were allowed if you notice that in the earlier parts in genesis and uh, god and and we, we will come to it and i said it a few weeks ago when Ke after cain killed abel and then he had another brother seth the bible said that cain went and he knew his wife where did cain get his wife and it had to be that adam and eve, eve had other children and so his wife no doubt would have come from one of those ladies that were there do you mean that Cain would have married his sister yes that is exactly what happened and that was permissible um and for, so many eyebrows are going up no but that is exactly what happened that is exactly what was allowed and the bible makes it clear that it was allowed there was a time however that god changed that arrangement and we are seeing that in the book of leviticus but there was a time before that that God allowed it. Now, most folks don't even know that Abraham and Sarah were brothers and sisters. Right? And the Bible tells us. And even if they were half-brothers, they were brothers from either the same father or the same mother. They were brothers and sisters. So that when Abraham told Abimelech at the time that she uh, was his sister, he really was not lying. I mean, he said it to protect himself from being killed. But he was not lying. He was coward, yes, but it was the truth. It was his sister. And the two were together. And the promise seed, which was Isaac, came. And all the blessings of Abraham came through Isaac. And Isaac was the son of Abraham and Sarah, who were brothers and sisters. So we're not going into that now. We'll pick that up at another time, but just to let us know. So it was, in fact, and indeed permissible. But then God had now changed the arrangement. In the same way, or in the time past, God allowed people to have more than one wife. It was not his intent from the beginning because we saw that it was just Adam and Eve. Things would have happened and God had winked and God allowed some things to happen. And so David could have many wives. Solomon could have many wives. But not only could they just have wives, they could also have, uh, you know, s s girlfriends on the side, concubines. And, f and there was a reason for it. And this is not the time to go into that, but just to let us know that sometimes some things are allowed by God, but then he then stops it. So we see today that God said, for any man, one wife. For any woman, one husband. And so, whereas in times past it was allowed, today this is what God requires. It was in the same way, whereas in the earlier parts of Genesis coming down, it was allowed because there would have been nobody else. There was a time, however, when God stepped in now and said, no more near of kin to be married. It was going to become a problem. And we will explain why at some subsequent study. So here it is now in Leviticus 18, verse 6. Um, God is talking uh, to his people and he's outlining some things to them. He said, none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him. To uncover their, their nakedness. I am the Lord. So that so all of a sudden we, we see the term now 
uncover their nakedness. And we are seeing, no, God is not talking here, you know, and we're going to look at some more scriptures. God is not here saying, if you glimpse or if you see your brother or your sister nakedness. If you look at the scripture, what it is literally telling us, when we see the term nakedness, to uncover nakedness, he's saying that if your brother or your sister or your mother or your father, next of kin, is basically saying, for your next of kin, what is for your next of kin, scripture, Le Leviticus 18 and verse 7, for your next of kin, or near of kin, do not uncover their nakedness. Say, I am the Lord. But then now, let us continue on, verse <coughs> 7. Y you know, and it, it, it is saying pretty much the same thing, and we are seeing, we are seeing something here, and I want us to understand the term. So when God is talking about uncovering nakedness or seeing nakedness, he's talking about, just as we would say, sleep with somebody, he's talking about sexual interaction. And we have to be very careful of that. And say, I am the Lord. Don't do it. No. The nakedness of thy father, we are at Leviticus 18 and verse 7, or the nakedness of thy mother shall thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. So just as he was talking in verse 6 and say, in the near of kin, don't uncover their nakedness, don't have no sexual relations with, the, with, her, with them, with him or her, they are next of kin or near of kin, don't do it. He is now in verse 17, said, the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shall thou not uncover. He is saying, you cannot have any kind of sexual intercourse. Mark you, God had to say this, you know, because it had happened before. And we will look at it later on as we go down because it happened in Genesis 19. If you can remember when Lot was taken out of Sodom, his daughters went into him. And it was out of that relationship, that incestuous, unholy relationship, that the Moabites and the Ammonites came. Uh, but we will get back to that. So it can happen, and it has happened before. And it will continue to happen. And God was now guiding Israel as to how they ought to operate in this particular arena. But notice the term that he used in describing that you mustn't have sex with your sister and sex with your brother and intercourse with mother or father. Into you, he used the term which they clearly understood to not to uncover their nakedness. No. Leviticus 18, let us look at verse 9, and I want us to read a little bit further. Because what this is saying now, verse 9, and we're going to read to about, probably about five or a couple verses down. I'll, I'll read and we'll just stop when we have seen enough. But here in this, these verses that we are reading, God is literally, God is literally talking to and warning the Israelite men who to or who not to sleep with. So hear what he's saying now. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Brothers and sisters, what God is saying to the Israelite men is telling them and he's warning them over and over who they must not sleep with. He said, don't sleep with your sister. Whether it's from your father's side alone or your, the, the daughter of your mother, or whether she be at home or whether she go away and gone far for long and she get big now and look different and you never have no link to her because you never see her for 20 years. So she, no, he's saying the nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Brothers and sisters, He's telling them who they must not go and lay down with, have rela sexual relation with. Let us read further. So, the nakedness of thy son's daughter or of thy daughter's daughter. In other words, fathers, you cannot have intercourse with your grandchildren. Mark, you know, God knows why he's putting these things here. But I'm reading this for us to understand. And let us read on. The, their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. For theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister. 
thou shalt not cover her nakedness. So they seem to be talking about um, the father having a wife that you know is not your own mother, but is still your sister, your half sister. But then that is what happened to Abraham, and God permitted it. Now he's putting it into the heart of Moses and said, Write it now. The thing has changed. But notice the term that he used to describe having the intercourse with your near of kin. The nakedness must not be uncovered. So the nakedness of thy father's wife, daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Read on a little more. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near king's woman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister. For she is thy mother's near king's woman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter in the law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. And we don't have to go anymore. We can read right down to verse 19. The point that I want to make, the point that I want to make is, brothers and sisters, we are seeing these scriptures and we are, we are clear in our minds that what God is talking about, <clears throat> what God is talking about is that the term see the nakedness of somebody is an expression of sexual intercourse. And it is important that we understand that. It is important that we see that whereas we might have had the impression before that when it talks up, when it's make the term seeing your nakedness, um, we mean you just see the person lying down naked on the ground. No, it is deeper than that. The term means it, it has that connotation. It is an idiom that shows and indicates and means sexual intercourse. And we must understand that. Very, very important. But let's look a little bit further. Because <clears throat> the Bible did say in the scripture that we, read, that we read earlier in Genesis 9, it didn't say that Ham uncovered his father's nakedness. He said that Ham saw his father's nakedness. So is it that the term uncover nakedness and Seeing nakedness is the same because all the scriptures that we have just read, it spoke to uncovering nakedness. And that was an idiomatic expression that means sexual intercourse. And we have showed it by scriptures. We are clear that God was telling you who not to have sexual intercourse with. And that there is no doubt there. But let us look now a little bit further at Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 17. Because we are going to see that it is describing the same thing, all right? <clears throat> Leviticus 20 and verse 17. We've seen that it is describing the same thing. But then we want to look at the term that is actually used. And then we will see something. So here Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 17 tells us, And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. So guess what has happened now? Look at this scripture. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness. So they actually, in the scripture, use the term, the very term, that was used with Ham seeing Noah. It used the term see his nakedness or see her nakedness. But then as it goes further, it spoke about the same thing and it said he had uncovered his sister's nakedness. Therefore, going back to the slide, to see nakedness 
and to uncover nakedness is the same thing. Brothers and sisters, we're going to go back to the scripture that we started with because we are going to make some assertions now. And when we put it to you, we are using these scriptures that we have just looked at to make the point. So we are seeing that seeing nakedness and uncovering nakedness is one and the same thing. And we are, we are seeing also <clears throat> that the term seeing one's nakedness or uncovering one's nakedness is a idiom, a term that expresses sexual activity between a man and a woman. Notice that in every instance that it is used, and we will get back to that, it is in relation to sexual activity between a man and a woman in every one of the case. In fact, let us look at Ezekiel because Ezekiel, the prophet, solidifies this in the writings that <coughs> he has outlined that we have looked at um, just now. If we look at Ezekiel 16 and verse 15, we look at Ezekiel 16 and verse 25, we look at Ezekiel 16 and verse 33. Uh, look at verse 36 and verse 37 of the same Ezekiel 16. It literally is showing that Ezekiel solidifies all that we have just said. And I'm going to explain simply how Ezekiel describe this particular thing. So here in Ezekiel 16 and verse 16, but thou didst trust in thine own beauty and play the harlot because of thy renown and thou poorest out thy fornication and everyone that passed by his it was. So as we start to read, we are realizing here now that Ezekiel is comparing Israel to a, a kind, a prostitute because she seemed to be committing fornication so this is now showing you know that it is a sexual act and, and he's likening what israel is doing to god as what a prostitute does uh, with a man every man that passed he tried to get them to go uh to bed with them with with them and he's literally linking the act of a prostitute with how israel is operating as god's beloved she played a harlot she have fornication with everyone that passed by because she thinks that she's beautiful and all it is an act of sexual activity so we go on to verse 25 and 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 just to just to go a little bit further to show exactly what it is that uh, Ezekiel is talking about thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred and hast opened up thy feet to everyone that passed by and multiplied thy whoredoms let us read on and, and go down the line we'll just jump to verse 33 and then we can read from 33 <clears throat> but he's talking about the whoredom of, of Israel thou give gifts to all whores but thou givest thy gift to all thy lovers they that men give gift to to all whores but thou givest thy gift to all thy lovers and hirest them that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom verse 36 <clears throat> and thou sayest and thus says the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers. So understand, you know, and thy nakedness discovered. The term is being used there as we read on. We see thy nakedness discovered and discovering your nakedness, seeing your nakedness, uncovering your nakedness. Notice that the term is used here, but what God was actually describing through the prophet Ezekiel is linking them or comparing them to a prostitute who have sexual intercourse and expose their nakedness. In other words, the term nakedness being discovered is a term that's saying, look here, you guys are filthy and you are having sexual intercourse with everybody 
Just like what a prostitute does. And thy nakedness is covered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children which thou didst give unto them. And verse 37, so we are seeing the term being used by Ezekiel. Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers <coughs> with whom thou hast taken pleasure and all them that thou hast loved with all them that thou hast hated. I will even gather them round about against thee and will discover thy nakedness unto them that they may see all thy nakedness. So I'm just going to expose all of what you have been doing, all the people that you sleep and have these things. I'm going to expose it and you will be ashamed. And here Ezekiel is talking about discovering nakedness and expressing the link with it being an incestuous, a, a, a prostitutional kind of relationship where a prostitute and a man get together and do, verse 38, and do the unthinkable. And pretty much he's saying, I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged and I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. So God is saying, because you have played the harlot, what does a harlot do? They have sex with every man that walk about the place. And Ezekiel is saying, you have operated just like that. And Ezekiel used the same term about discovering nakedness or seeing nakedness or, or um, uncovering nakedness. Same term. And we are seeing that Ezekiel is solidifying that it is literally linked with how and what it is that a man and a woman does. So brothers and sisters, it is important that we understand it. But we still have further to go. How does things tie in? Something is happening here that we need to know. Tie up. Clearly something is coming up and we start to see something um, going back to where and how we started. So we started off, brothers and sisters, by saying that Ham came over when his father was drunk and saw his father's nakedness. He saw his father's nakedness. And <coughs> we, are, we, are going to, we are going to just take a little time, if I may just take a minute, and take us back to show a little connection so we can see where... I am going and then we come back to this slide. So having said all that I have just said and having looked at the scriptures that I have just looked at, brothers and sisters, something new should be emerging in our thoughts as we read those verses again from Genesis chapter number 9. Something ought to be jumping at us something ought to be emerging there is a linkage that we are seeing because now we are observing that ham recognizing that his father was out of it drunk and stoned out went over his father's tent and saw his father's nakedness it means he did something of a sexual nature because that is what that idiomatic term means. Seeing his father's nakedness, uncovering his father's nakedness, discovering their nakedness. It means the same thing. It is a term that expresses sexual activity. So he went across the tent in his father's drunken stupor and uncovered his father's nakedness. So it could mean that the Wickedness of thing happened. He went over to his father's tent and did something of a sexual nature while his father was drunk. Is it that he did the unthinkable and buggered his father? Because those kind of things we knew of happening before. Or is it that he still did the unthinkable and went in to his mother? Well, the Bible said he discovered his father's nakedness. It, it didn't say he discovered his mother's nakedness. 
it says he discovered his father's nakedness. Which is very significant. Because nowhere, because we could live with the thoughts coming into our mind. Whoa, it looked like Ham did something serious based on what we are now learning and based on what we are now picking up from the scriptures that we have read in Leviticus, the scriptures that we have read in Ezekiel. We are picking up something here. Clearly something terribly wrong had gone down. But the Bible said he discovered his father's nakedness, which means, based on what we know the term now to mean, it seemed as if he went in and knew his father. But there is something I want us to dig a little bit deeper into and to grasp. Because the Bible made no mention about him uncovering his mother's nakedness. It only spoke of his father's nakedness. But let us go further. Let us dig a little bit deeper. Let us look at a few more scriptures and see if something emerged that now cause us to see more and that makes the plot even more thicker. Let us go to Leviticus chapter number 18 again and see what is there. Leviticus chapter 18. We want to see how this ties in. We want to see how this get together because <clears throat> we want to be clear. We want to be very clear that we know that we have the thing in a particular, particular lie. Leviticus 18 and verse 7. It says this, the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Verse 8. <clears throat> and we are bringing it up. The nakedness of thy father's wife which would be thy mother, shall thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. <clears throat> I wonder if we, let us, let us go again and let us see if we get something coming out of this, brothers and sisters. So let us go back to verse 7. I want us to understand and I want us to see it coming out. It is all in the Bible. It is all in the book. And I want us to be very clear and to see what is being said and what is coming out at all. <clears throat> the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. And in verse 8, the nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover it is thy father's nakedness. What it is saying, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> what it has just done, it has just equated mother's nakedness with father's nakedness. It is one <clears throat> and the same. So that if the expression is you have uncovered or you have seen your father's nakedness, it is the same thing if it is that they had written, you have uncovered your mother's nakedness. So something could have happened. That signal that something of a sexual nature took place. And you uncovered your mother's nakedness. But it is still described as uncovering or seeing your father's nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife, which are the nakedness of your mother, it is thy father's nakedness. So it will be described that way. What we saw in Genesis chapter 9, what we read being described is that Ham discovered or saw Noah's nakedness, his father's nakedness. It means something of a sexual nature took place. But it was not with Noah. Brethren, I submit to you based on what the scripture is saying here that the nakedness of your father is the same thing as the nakedness of your mother. Ham went into his father's tent 
and uncovered his mother's nakedness and it was a wicked thing and when Noah got out of his drunkenness and knew he knew what Ham did unto him and that's why I said from the beginning it signaled to us that something of a of, of gravity took place just from all the scripture put it he knew what Ham had done to him it wasn't merely that he saw him naked because he was drunk and on the ground anyway what Ham did brothers and sisters he went in based on what the term nakedness seeing your father's nakedness mean is the same thing as seeing your mother's nakedness and notice it always is used in conjunction between sexual activity of a man and a woman it is never used in conjunction with a man and a man never when we look at god talking about homosexual relationship and a man must not go with a man he never uses the term uncovering the man's nakedness anytime the term father's nakedness or mother's nakedness or sister's nakedness or brother's nakedness is used in terms of uncovering or seeing it is always in relation to sexual activity between a man and a woman what is jumping out at us brothers and sisters is that ham did the unthinkable and went into his father's tent when he was drunk and knew his own mom and guess what the unthinkable notice going back now to the scripture that we started out with when moses told us two times in short order in very short order he told us two times in very short order and ham is the father of canaan and then by this by the other verse where he mentions it again he mentions it in relation to Ham seeing his father's nakedness. Read it, brothers and sisters, and see the thing jumping at us. It putting it together and it, it sounds far reaching, but we're going further because there's more to go. But it sounds far reaching. But clearly, Ham did something terrible and something linked Canaan to what Ham did. Because there's no way if Ham just looked at the person on the ground being naked and tell him, brother, go cover him up and make a fuss about it. There's no way that that could have had anything to do with Canaan. And the fact that Canaan keep, is kept being mentioned and being mentioned as the son of Ham. You just look at all that has been said and we start to realize that Ham went into his father's tent, saw his father's nakedness, which is the same thing as his mother's nakedness, and the term means sexual activity, Ham went into the tent and did the unthinkable, and the lady conceived, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Canaan came, and it was not Noah's son, but came through Noah's wife, but it was not Noah's son. Moses was telling us Canaan's father was Ham. And he tell us two times in quick succession for us to understand that Ham is the father of Canaan, not Noah. Why? Because something incestuous has happened. And when Noah came about, came to himself, I don't know how much time had passed. And we, the questions will come in and I will deal with the questions afterwards. This was why Noah, when things had settled down, cursed Canaan. It was the offspring. He was the offspring of a wicked act, a wicked and incestuous and unholy relationship. And this Canaan came about. That's the link with Ham and Canaan and Noah cursed that offspring and declare all through the ages what was going to happen and we know who the Canaanites were and then one of the sons of Canaan uh, was the father of the Hittites so all the Hittites and the, the Perizzites and all the people who was a thorn in the flesh of Israel down the line came out of this 
incestuous relationship. Now it sounds far-fetched and it sounds absurd. And we out, hold your horses, saints of God. Hold your peace. Because the Bible has some things. Let us go back to the slides because I just want us to look at it as we start to bring it together now. Clearly some serious things that happened. Now the writer Moses, as I said earlier, equated mother's nakedness with father's nakedness. It is one and the same. Now I want us to look at the NIV translation of Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 7. The NIV is a more modern translation. And listen to what it, how it outlines the entire verse. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Don't have sexual relations with her. So that even as the scripture in the later translations put it together, they are seeing, they are seeing and interpreting in the thing that you cannot dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. The act of dishonoring Noah, what Ham did to dishonor Noah, brothers and sisters, was not to just see him on the ground. No, that wasn't, that, that wasn't the act of dishonoring him. See what the NIV translated station is saying here you're going to dishonor your father if you dare to go in and uncover his wife's nakedness or have sexual relations with your mother that was clearly as you drill into it what seemed to have transpired there and hence the curse being placed on the canaan who was the offspring of an unholy and godly incestuous relationship. So that is, that is very, 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 very important. And we had to put it and bring it out exactly to us as it is. We just went through this. He saw his father's nest. This is exactly what he's saying. He went into his father's wife. It was illicit. It was incestuous. And the offspring was cursed. Brothers and sisters, it sounds hard to accept, but it is what it is because this is what the thing was describing. Now you're saying, but how could he do that? I mean, it's, it's crazy, but hold on. And this is why I say hold on. So we'll look at the next slide because this is not, <clears throat> we look at the next slide. This is not new. In fact, in the same Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4, you know that the Bible tells us that the sons of men saw that the daughters of went into the daughters of men and they were fear and they were and they had relationship that something was wrong. Now there are different schools of thought as to who the sons of men were. The Bible said, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, right? That and we'll just, just read a few of us, read probably verses 1 to 4, just read it for us so that we can get a perspective, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, saw the daughters of men, that they were fear, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that they bear children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And what we are seeing here, and we're coming to other scriptures, but what we are seeing here is that the sons of men went into the daughters of men because they were fear. And, you know, folks have different thing to, things to say about who these sons of men were. But whoever they were, the fact is the offspring were such that the offsprings were what you call the Nephilims. They were giants. And it was out of this lineage that came that young man that was the champion of the Philistines whose name was Goliath. And Goliath himself had some brothers like him, but they were from a lineage of giants. And 
it's coming from all the way back to this point in Genesis. Now, whatever the illicit affair was, something went wrong. And these giants came about. And so, from early in Genesis 6, we see affairs, men and women, doing some things that were illicit, that were wrong, that was outside of what God intended, and it had severe consequences. But here we saw something from as early as Genesis 6, but it is not true as yet. Because even after the episode with Noah, when we go down to uh, ch chapter 19 of the same book of Genesis, we saw that lot, and we, you probably won't have to read it, but you can just make a note of it, and it will come up on the screen in a little while, but Genesis chapter 19 from about verse 30 to 38, we are going to see that after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot came out and himself and his two daughters, his wife was destroyed also. But notice that when Lot came out, it was just himself. They were in a cave. They thought the whole world was destroyed. They thought everything was done and totally, total annihilation had taken place. And it was only Lot and his two daughters. The Bible says that they caused Lot to be drunk with wine. And one by one they went into him. And you know, those that were born. And it sounds, again, it sounds terrible. The man with his daughters. Only that this, and, but come to think of it. It is the daughters that initiated it. Just like in Ham. It was the son that initiated it. It was not anything new it was showing the depravity of man but just looking at the situation we see that the things really could have happened just like we said because it also happened after with lot and his two daughters they went into their fathers they went into their father sorry and they had child of the children of their father and it is through them that the Moabites and the Ammonites came. Again, another group of people that would ultimately become thorns in the flesh of Israel. Just like the Nephilim, the giants, that Goliath came out of that lineage, that is a part of the Philistines. So the Philistines, the Moabites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, all of these folks were thorns in the flesh of Israel to this day, all came out of incestuous, ungodly relationships. And that is what happened. And to the extent that Canaan himself was cursed, and all that came under him was going to be servants to their brother Shem and Japheth. That is how the Bible put it, scenes of the most I God. But the big question, and let's go back to the slide. The big question now is this. Why did Ham go and tell his brothers what he did? Brothers and sisters, I submit to us. He was declaring that he was now in the role of leadership because he, he remember, no, no, he did what he did and then he went and tell them. So he was declaring something to them. He was now saying, look, I have usurped authority. I am now in charge. He is the head patriarch because he has conquered Noah's wife, who was his mother. But how could that make somebody become the head? How could that put somebody in charge? How could that make you and place you in a role of headship and leadership? Brothers and sisters, in the olden days, we, we need to, in the ancient world, and again, we need to understand times and customs. If we don't, we can overlook, we can miss serious insights that are there for us to understand and to grasp. And, we, and to use, to put together so that we have a fulsome understanding of what is happening. In the ancient world, this is how individuals sought to show conquest. It was a clear way to demonstrate that you have conquered and that you are now in charge by taking one's wife or concubine. If we, if we didn't understand that, we would not have 
understood why he went to his brothers he is making it known to them now that he is in charge because this is what i have done and so sir brother daily bishop where you got that from what do you mean in the ancient world this is how individuals show conquest well let us look the the, the bible actually tells us the bible actually tells us that this is exactly what happens i want us to look at a couple of scriptures because it, unless we are able to look at the scriptures you know and put them together and put line upon line and precept upon precept unless we are able to do it and i'm going to just use this to to, to wrap up for this evening to but let me just explain to us that this is exactly how the thing has been done in the ancient world the bible tells us yes in second samuel 15 and verse 13 you remember absalom wanted to take over and to overthrow his dad king david yes he wanted to do that and after a while the bible said that he kept on going he kept on going to the people and address the needs of the people and stole the hearts of the people and so that happening now he was making his move to overthrow his dad and he actually he actually moved at it yes he actually moved at it and that is what is in, important for us but listen for us to understand he moved at it in what at, in fact his dad had to run at one point take some of his wives take his wives take others of his servants and ran there was a coup against king david second samuel 15 and verse 13 said and there came a messenger there came a messenger to david saying the hearts of the men of israel are after absalom and so this is now the man taking authority want to take control want to exert that he was king and he move to overthrow his father but i want us to notice something as we go down to verse 16 look at verse 16 cha uh, chapter 16 sorry not verse 16 second samuel chapter 16 i want us to look at chapter 16 and verse 21 and 22 because this now start to put things in a particular perspective i want us to understand what was happening so here now in verse 16 and david said unto micah Michael, sorry. And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the, the Lord. Verse 22. And I will yet be more vile than the and will be based in my own sight and uh, uh all right so i think i might have mm, i might it's the same mm, i think i have a scripture wrong here but i will i will get back to the correct scripture in a short while but this is the i'll get the correct scripture first in a short while pardon me on that uh but here is the point i am making in second samuels are we keeping that slide in second samuels 15 and verse 13 we see where Absalom was stealing the heart of the people and his, his, his dad had to run away. But then now, it came to a point when one of the priests came over to Absalom and indicated to Absalom that, look here, your dad has gone and he has gone with his wives and he has gone with his servants, but he has left back ten of his concubines. He has left back ten of his concubines and that was very significant he left back some of them now hear the advice that he got from this high-ranking person if you are going to consolidate your power you have got to go in onto david's concubines onto your father's concubines you got to go into them and given that advice from such a high-ranking person, David literally went in to all ten of those concubines. And look, let me tell you, he not only did that, but he went unto them in the sight of all Israel 
and he did it on a rooftop he did it on a rooftop as okay so let me read it for us now so we are we are back it's second samuel 16 i'm not sure we oh, I got it wrong but we have the right, the correct scripture up now so it's second samuel chapter 16 and let us read 21 and then on to 22 and ahitophel said unto absalom now this is a high ranking advisor go in unto thy father's concubines which he has left to keep the house and all israel israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong in other words by going into your father's concubines you are going to be abhorred by your father and it means that you would have now taken over your father has now retreated in put you aside you have taken over his house his concubines his women you are now in charge by doing that he's saying your hands will be strong brothers and sisters taking over somebody's wife and concubine is an attempt to make your arms strong and to show that you are now in charge and that is exactly what happened when david had to flee and when absalom took over and was trying to consolidate his hand he got word from a heat of hell that this is what you have to do to consolidate your power and listen look at verse 22 verse 22 knows so they spread absalom a tent upon the top of the house and absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all israel no in the past when we read these scriptures we were just saying what a stupid man what a wicked man and we saw all kind of things if we don't understand the background brothers and sisters we would not have realized that this man is not just doing it because he is an armor and he has more testosterone than anybody else no that is not it he could get any ladies that he wanted he could he, 10 was here he could have had 20 or 40 or 50 he was a prince he was probably the crown prince so he could have had it all that was not his intention he was not short of women brothers and sisters he was making a statement he was consolidating his power and in those days that time and long before that a sign of consolidation of power a sign of taking authority was to go in to the patriarch or the king or the head whoever was in charge you conquer their wives or their concubines and you would have taken over and show them is the same thing in the animal kingdom when a new lion young lion comes if he wants to take over the first thing he does is try to kill the other lion and to subdue the lioness and once he subdues her and subdue mean you know lion and uncovering the lion nakedness <laughs> having intercourse with the, the female once he does that he is now the new king of the jungle in that particular block well it was the same thing and absalom went on the roof and notice they said they spread the tent on top of a roof because they wanted everybody to see brothers and sisters this is what ham did he now went to his brothers and told them because he wanted them to know what he did so that they could understand that he was now in charge this is exactly what absalom did he put it up there for them to see he didn't have to go tell anybody he put it there for them to see this is what i am doing i am now the king but brothers and sisters let's go a little bit further I want to make the point even clearer and this is god now speaking let us look to second samuel chapter number 12 and verse 7 and i'm going to, have to wrap it up now because the, the time is upon me um, for this for this evening let us look at second samuel chapter number 12 and verse 7 we are going to see that 
believe me brethren when we start to put the things together and understand the, the terminologies and the expression and understand the the, the times and and the seasons and how things were when we understand the environment and when we understand the places and the customs and these are things as i said i'm going to go into it so that we can understand it not in the study of genesis you know but as we go further and so listen to what nathan the prophet said to david in second samuel 12 and verse 7 and nathan said to david thou art the man thus saith the lord god of israel i anointed thee king over israel and i delivered thee out of the hand of saul i delivered thee out of the hand of saul river and verse 8 now and i gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of israel and of judah and if that had not been if that had been too little i would moreover have given unto thee such and such things so now listen to what has happened and this is god now talking being related by nathan the prophet i am the one that put you here thou art the man you i'm going to be made king and having done that god is showing you what he did to solidify the house of david as the house of the king i give thee thy master's house and thy master's wives god said that to david understand brothers and sisters that it was just like that in those days and before that a sign of your leadership and headship and authority and your being in charge is your conquering your having control of your subduing sexually the wife of either your enemy the concubines of your enemy or anybody over who you want to usurp authority that is what absalom did that is what happened to david although david did not commit a coup but god gave him the kingdom and because god gave him the kingdom god also gave him saul's wives and that is exactly what happened and it is the same thing that ham did when he went into the tent and then came back and make it known to everybody who was really just Shem and Japheth and probably their wives because nobody else was there apart from their and their children and he made it known to them that means he was telling them I am now the head patriarch I am now in charge I am the one that have authority if you don't believe me let me close with this last one in 2nd Kings chapter 2 and verse 17 you remember Adonijah he wanted to be king when David was up in age and David was gearing up to die Adonijah came on the scene and and went and almost crowned himself king had a big feast with all of the prophet the, the, the priest sorry and the, the mighty men of valor and was gearing himself up to be king so he had that intention he, he had that intention second kings you know second kings chapter 2 and verse 17 he had that intention right and it is important for us to know that david changed the entire plan david literally changed the entire plan he literally changed the entire plan what david did and let us just slip to the slide i'll just give us the let's put the slide back up and i will just give us the right so adonijah moved to take possession of the throne even while david was still alive david had to king david had to intervene and quash that and install solomon on the throne and we know that story very well and the thing about it is simply this when solomon was now king adonijah realizing that it did not go his way yes 
we can see what his intentions were. The fact that he ran ahead and wanted to put him on the throne. Put himself on the throne. The fact that he did that showed that he had that seed inside of his head right from the very beginning. But King David turned it around and Solomon was installed on the throne. Solomon was placed there by King David, was placed there by Almighty God. But the Bible tells us that after Solomon was installed and everything, Adonijah came to Solomon's mother. Adonijah came to Solomon's mother and made a particular request. And it is important that we understand the nature of the request. Because we all knew what happened, you know. The Bible tells us that based on the request that Adonijah made to Solomon, Solomon called in his men to fall upon him, to kill him. Why would Solomon do such a thing? Why would Solomon kill his brother? Oh, because he asked for a particular person to be married to. That's hard, that's cold, that's callous. And it, these are the things that sometimes, if we don't understand context, we will not really understand what was happening. Now, most of us don't recall the name of the person that Adonijah asked to be married to. So Adonijah subtly went in to Solomon's mother, who was Bathsheba, and said to her, Long live the queen. Please ask the king on my behalf. I just want to marry to somebody and ask him if I could get such and such to marry to them. Do you know, brothers and sisters, whose hands he asked for in marriage? It was one of King David's wife, former wives. By now, King David probably would have died. Yes, by now, King David would have died. He asked for one for the wife, the former wife of David. That's strange, considering they all knew in that time what such a request can mean. If you and I don't know, we would say, what is wrong? Him just ask for, for, a, for a lady for his wife. I mean, what's wrong with that? Let me tell us what's wrong with that. This lady was the former wife. And former meaning only because King David died. So it was David's widow. If, if Solomon gave him the wife of the former king and he went into her and he uncovered her nakedness or he slept with her or any of the term that we know to say that he had intercourse in that, he now would have a royal seed that would be antagonistic to Solomon and his seed. It would be a problem. It would show that he is trying to usurp authority. Notice the answer that Solomon gave when his mother came to him. He said, what? He asked for the wife, for the hands of such and such in marriage. Oh, so, you're, so are you going to ask for the kingdom for him also? Why would Solomon go there? Because he knew that if you give this man the wife of the former king, you're giving him a reason to exert authority and to have a contending seed with the existing king. He said, oh, the fact that you can ask me to give the man, this lady, mind as well, you tell me, mama, to give him the kingdom. Because that is what it meant. And notice that Solomon moved immediately and killed Adonijah. He knew what it meant. Brothers and sisters, this is the custom or was the custom of the day going all the way back. What Ham did and called his brothers and let them know was for them to understand that he was now fully in charge. And we see it coming all the way down. It, it is a mouthful today, but this is how dangerous, this is how much it can affect our stomachs 
just to hear and to dig a bit deeper to find out exactly what it was that Ham did that would have caused Noah to declare and to, to, to state or to make it known when he knew what Ham did to him. And then to turn around and to curse Canaan. Clearly Canaan was connected from the beginning with Ham. Ham went in and did the unthinkable and a seed, a son came out of that unholy, incestuous relation. And that seed was cursed from before it was born. I will go through to expand and address the questions that would naturally emerge from this. But I'll have to take that up next time. Because for this evening, I must close now. So God bless you. We are still in the book of Genesis. And there is still more things that we are going to unearth. Still more things that we are going to see as we go down. And who was Melchizedek, by the way? What was his purpose? What was it that was so queer and at the same time serious about him? That in his days, Abraham, the architect, the father of the faithful, the father of the Jewish nation had to bow to him and pay tithes to him. Who was this Melchizedek that in the New Testament time the writers wrote about him and esteemed him in a particular way? That man that showed up in Genesis. Who was this man? And so we have that to look at. There's so much in Genesis, so much to learn, so much that we can put together. Let us not be sidetracked. Let nobody tell us that the book must not be trusted and the book cannot be real and the book cannot be right. It is the word of God. It is sure and there is so much to learn from it. And if we take our time and put line upon line and precept upon precept and if we put the different things together, understand the terminologies, understand the, the Hebrew writings and the, 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 the different languages that it was written in and how when it came across, how we can miss the interpretation if we don't understand certain background. So we are going to go into that. And as I said, when we finish the book of Genesis, there are some things I'm going to go through us, with us as a body so that together we are clear as to meanings of words, as to times and seasons, as to context to put scriptures in so that we can know that we are along to getting the right interpretation within the right context and understand clearly line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It is so important. But we are in this thing together since. We are going to go through this thing together and we are going to have a deeper, clearer understanding of a lot of things. There are some scriptures I'm going to go through with us that are hard scriptures and they, 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 they sound so far-fetched. But we are going to understand them. When we understand the context. You remember the scripture that says it is, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom? If we don't understand the context, you know, if we don't understand what a, the eye of a needle is in the terms of the people who are writing, we would leave as many have thinking is a needle that you, you saw with. Not even some thread can go through that needle, much less a camel. It couldn't be that. That's impossible. And yet Jesus did not say it was impossible because you had rich men in the church and around him that buried him in his time. But we're going to go through it so that we can understand context and we can all be blessed. I must stop here. But we are in the book of Genesis still. God's willing next week, same time, and we continue and explore and learn and expand our knowledge of the word of God. God bless you. Just before I pray, Remember, saints of the Most High God, that this Friday, please, it is Jerk Friday. We are still in building fund mode, a massive, massive luncheon we are going to have. And for that day, we are asking you, please, just take lunch from us. Just, we're going to have chicken, we're going to have pork, we're going to have fish. Please come by. Lunch will start being served from about 11 o'clock. Just make your call. Just swing by. We are going to just prepare for everybody. And we don't want anything to waste. Take your lunch. Take your dinner. Don't do nothing on that day called cooking. Just take it from us and supply the... So, uh, sorry. And take it from us and just do what you can to support the initiative in relation to our building program thank you so much god bless you and we look forward to a great turnout walking driving 
you fly in anything, but we want us to be in this thing together. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Father, we bless your great name. We thank you again for allowing us to meet one more time and to have Bible study. Touch our minds, touch our hearts. Let your words flow into our system. Help us to grow. Help us to expand and stretch yourself out in us, O oh God, as we continue to study your word and to learn more and more day by day. Have your own way. Let your will be done. We give you thanks. We glorify you. We magnify you, great God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. God richly bless you. Thank you so much for being in Bible study tonight. God's willing, next week, same time, as we continue in the book of Genesis to explore and to be edified. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.